All right. So this is the mechanical level switch kind of webinar where we're going to give you guys an understanding of how to select a level switch and, and give you a, kind of an understanding of just the product line in, in general. On the agenda today, what we're going to do is we're going to start off with the principles of operation, just, you know, how the product works, give you an understanding of, of that. And then, then we're going to go into when to select a float versus a displacer, um, and then the next steps on actually selecting the right model number. Um, then we'll get into some applications, specific applications and scenarios where a level switch performs really well, um, and then get into some competition information. And then um, if you have any questions at the end, um, feel free to answer them. But anytime during this presentation, feel free to ask a question um, in the chat box. We have everyone muted to make sure to eliminate some background noise. Um, but if you have a question at any time, feel free to type it into the chat box and we'll answer it as we go along here. Uh, so principles of operation. Um, so we're starting off with float technology here first. So the floats operate under the same principles as ocean liners. So the float actually rides on top of the liquid and displaces that fluid so that it can actually float on top of the liquid. So you can see there over to the right is a diagram of how that, uh, of the main components of the float switch. And what you have there is you have a float, which is the primary sensing element. This is the device that will actually transfer all the movement um, to the switching element itself. Um, so that's connected to a stem. And, and then on that stem, you have an attraction sleeve. And then that attraction sleeve is inside of an enclosing tube. And that enclosing tube seals off the process from all the electrical switching element and enclosure on the inside as well. Now, the displacers are very similar in how they operate to float switches. And so instead of having a, a float on there, you have a displacer. And what a displacer is, is just basically a chunk of metal or a chunk of some type of heavy uh, material that um, will not float on a liquid. So if you drop that just by itself into the liquid, it would sink to the bottom of the tank. And so what you have to do is counterbalance that force. And so what you have there is this spring, this extension spring here, and that spring actually is always pulling that displacer upwards um, to counterbalance that force or that weight of the displacer. And now how you actually get the, the displacer to rise is when the liquid comes in contact with the displacer, that displacer actually becomes lighter. So you can think of it when you're in a swimming pool, things become lighter and easier to pick up in a pool um, than they do when they're outside of a pool. And that's essentially what's going on here is when that liquid goes in contact with the displacer, it becomes lighter. And so that when it becomes lighter, that spring is able to pull it up more and actuate a switch. So the actual switching element inside of the um, housing uh, works like this. So they, that attraction sleeve has some type of carbon steel or uh, metallic material or uh, magnetic material inside of it that is inside of that enclosing tube. So that's all inside of the process. And then on the outside of the process here, you actually have the actual switching um, mechanism itself. So on that switching mechanism, you have this magnet here. That magnet sits on the outside of the enclosing tube. And when the switch is deactuated, that magnet is away from the enclosing tube. When it's actuated, that attraction sleeve goes up into the enclosing tube and interacts with that magnet, pulling that magnet towards the enclosing tube to actuate a switch or a micro switch inside of the housing. And we could talk about these uh, selecting the right switch for days. I mean, there's, there's so much um, information to know and, and different capabilities that we have, but this is more of just a general overview, and uh, I want to keep it to around 30 minutes. So this is just kind of a high-level overview of how to select a pressure switch. Well, I mean, uh, a level switch. Um, so steps to selecting the right sw uh, level switch. So step one, you need to understand if you need a float or a displacer. So that's really the first step that you kind of need to take um, into to selecting the right level switch. And so the advantages and disadvantages between the two. Now, this is just, these are just advantages and disadvantages between a float and a displacer, not necessarily the advantages of a mechanical level switch in general or a disadvantage of a me mechanical level switch in general. So the advantages for a float type technology over a displacer 
is going to be temperature. So with a float, um, there's really no part. The only parts that are weakened by temperature are the metal um, and, and are solid metal. So you can actually achieve very high temperatures, upwards of 1,200 degrees F um, for steam applications for uh, float-based technology. The other, uh, one of the other advantages is a side mount option. So with a displacer, you can't really, can't get a side mount option for a displacer mechanical level switch. And then also float-based technologies are typically, um, in general, less expensive than displacer type technologies. Um, so some of the disadvantages, um, the disadvantages are, are pressure. So higher pressures are sometimes harder to achieve with lower SGs. They can be achieved higher pressures and, and um, at lower SGs, but the price will increase dramatically for, for that need. Low SGs require larger floats, um, which become more expensive. So the higher the pressure, the lower the SG, the more we have to bulk that float up, bulk the chamber up, and that makes it a more expensive product. Floats are also susceptible to turbulence. They're not too bad with turbulence, but they're more susceptible than a displacer would be. Um, and then there's some industries, applications, and we'll get more into that kind of stuff later on. Floats versus displacers, displacers now. So the advantages for a displacer are going to be quite the opposite when it comes to pressures and temperatures. Displacers are very good for high pressure applications. They can easily do upwards of 5,000 PSI. And the reason for that is because you don't really have to worry about that weight of the displacer, whereas with the float, you really have to worry about the, the weight of the float. So with the displacer, you can really beef that displacer up and make it strong enough to be able to handle 5,000 PSI um, without having to worry about the weight because you can counterbalance that weight with that spring. The other advantage is low SG capabilities. So with that spring, you can kind of really fine tune that force balance equation in there um, and you can really achieve low SGs, so downwards of 0.4 SG, which is pretty low, and we can actually even go lower than that if necessary. With displacers also, you can also achieve multiple set points. So we can actually have three different set points for a displacer where you can even have multiple displacers on there all sensing three different points inside of the chamber or inside of the tank. Like we said earlier, displacers are also less susceptible to turbulence. Disadvantages, so the biggest disadvantage with displacers is going to be the uh, temperature. So anything above 450 degrees requires us to use a float. And the reason for that is because that spring that is used on a displacer-based level switch is not good for upwards of 450 degrees because springs actually will lose their spring force, the higher the temperature. Um, so essentially, if that spring is lost, um, you lose the capabilities of that level switch. The other disadvantages is the only top mount option. And then also, typically, displacer type level switches are going to be more expensive than a float based level switch. So, step two step two is going to be you got to know your mounting style, what mounting style you want. And so, the three main mount, mounting styles that you can have are going to be top mount, side mount, and then chambered. So top mount is just what, what it sounds like. You just insert it through the top of the tank. This is mainly used for high-level alarm. Um, since you're already up at the top of the tank, it's, it's easier to just get the high-level alarm there than rather um, starting at the top and then having the sensing element go all the way down to the bottom of the tank for low-level alarm. Some of the limitations are, are minimum SG. So through a top mount, um, you, for, especially for float-based technologies, you have to have a guide stem on there. So if you have a really long guide stem or a, for that float, that stem will actually add weight to the float and cause it to um, become heavier, essentially, which will limit your SG capabilities. The models there are over there on the side as well. So the 300 series is the float-based top mount, and then the 700 series displacers are your are your displacer type, and then we also have a a compact um, top mount float level switch as well. So the second mounting style is going to be side mount. Side mount will is what it sounds like. You mount on the side of the tank, and so the advantages here are you have low SG capabilities, and this is only for floats. But the low SG capabilities allows you 
because it's a side mount, that float can actually be counterbalanced with a weight on the other side. So that side mount allows you to really almost make it become a displacer type level switch where it's a force balance equation rather than all being directed off of the float of the uh, level switch. Because of this counterbalance, we can actually beef that float up more by just adding more weight to the float and then adding more weight to the other side of the counterbalance as well. So that's, uh, that allows us to achieve much higher pressures and also lower SGs as well. Then this can be used for low or high level alarm very easily. It's just a matter of where your port is on, this, on the tank. The models there are going to be your 400 series. That's the, the product in the picture there. We also have the compact 1500 series level switch, um, and then also the mid-size 1710-2210 option as well. Um, and then the third mounting style is going to be chambered. So chambered is can be serviceable or non-serviceable conditions or configurations. So the difference between those two is going to be if it's serviceable, that means that you have a flange connection between the float electronics or the electronics and then also the inside of the chamber. So that allows you to access that float, to swap out the float if you need to, to service it or clean it or whatever you need to do. Non-serviceable would be a sealed chamber. Um, and the sealed chambers are typically less expensive, um, but you lose that capability of servicing um, the inside of the chamber. You would also use a, ch a chambered level switch to protect it from turbulence. So a lot of times inside of these tanks, it's not necessarily just a calm liquid. There's a lot of waves going on or there's turbulence and or spinning action going on inside of the tank. So if you install it in a, into a separate chamber, that turbulence is mitigated and you can protect your float and protect your um, displacer a lot, a lot better and actually prevent false trips in the level and get a much more stable reading. And then also this allows you to service the tank or service the level or swap out the level switch without having to drain the tank. So if you have to, for some reason, change that level switch out, um, you can install isolation valves, close off those valves and, and take that level switch off without having to shut down your process. So step three, step three is going to be pressure, temperature, and then specific gravity. You got, you, you're going to need to know these things to finally be able to pick the last step of selecting the model number that you need. So going back here for a second, you have to, so now you've decided that you need a, you, you've decided if you need a float or displacer type technology. So let's run through an example here. You decide you need a float based technology. And then now you, step two is the mounting style. So you pick the chain, you say you need a chamber. So let's go here and you pick 100, the uh, 100 series, 100 series level switch. From here, you now have to select the, the individual model series. So this individual model series or model number is based off of the max pressure, the max temperature, and then the minimum SG requirement. And so what you need to do is you need to match all three of these requirements. So on this table, you, you come to the table and say your pressure is uh, 600 degrees or 600 PSI and your max temperature is 200 degrees Fahrenheit and your SG is 0.8. Well, you can come down here, select a 122, and you'd be good. And that's, that's basically the, the gist of it. It's not, um, not a very complex system. But that is essentially how you select your model series. Now, there's other steps into selecting the full model, model strength. You need to select materials of the chamber, the actual switching element, things like that. But this is the real basis for picking what model number is best for your application. Now, even more in depth, um, we have a bunch of different options between, you know, the large level catalog, um, the 1710, 2210, and then also our compact 1500 series level switches as well. Question that gets asked a lot is when to use, what's the difference between the three and when to use one over the other? And so really it comes down to capabilities, costs, and what application it's going into. So down there on the x-axis, you'll see that represents the applications and then also the cost of the unit. So if you go to the far right, you have difficult ex um, existing applications that are um, require very um, heavy-duty level switches um, to be installed. So you're going to have a much higher cost, um, whereas to the far left, 
You have OEM applications that are, are typically very pay, repeatable applications that don't have to change the product very often, um, and they're very, fairly simple applications as well. Um, and then over here on the y-axis, we have the capabilities. So the capabilities represents um, what the product can really do, um, and then also how much um, we can actually alter the product to be able to provide a special custom configuration. So the large level product over here at the top, top right, represents really unlimited capabilities of what we can do as far as special materials, special process connections, um, special SGs, pressures, temperatures, all that stuff. Whereas if you go down to the far bottom left, the 1500 series, um, while it's much lower in cost, lacks the ability to really customize the unit as far as ma making sure it can match every single specification of temperature, pressure, um, SG, materials, all that kind of stuff. And then in the middle of the range here, you have the 1710-2210. Um, that kind of gives you the best of both worlds. Uh, so moving on to applications now. Where to sell mechanical level? So mechanical level is a proven technology. It's been out on the market for 80 plus years now. And it's, it's, it's a product, it's a, it's a technology that's not going away. This product it has a marketplace where it's, it's one of the best options or best technologies that you can pick for certain applications. So some of those areas are going to be demanding applications. Applications that are over 800 degrees Fahrenheit, pressures upwards of 3,500 3, PSI, and then harsh vibration um, applications as well. There's really not going to be very many other types of technologies that can be able to handle these extreme process conditions. Where changing conditions require product flexibility, a lot of times the process will actually change temperature, it will change pressure often, and it, it, won't, it will be affecting the actual technology that's inside the, the tank. With a float and a displacer type technology, the minimum process the minimum, it has minimal pressure and temperature effects on the performance of the product. Whereas, say, if you have a differential pressure transmitter measuring the level in the tank, well, if the temperature and pressure changes quite frequently, the SG will actually change in the tank as well, and that will give you a false reading or a false understanding of where that level's at. So immune to changes in dielectric constant, solid contact viscosity, et cetera. So with guided wave radars or technologies that rely on the dielectric of the actual process, that dielectric can change or fluctuate quite frequently and this type of technology, this buoyancy type technology, is completely unaffected by those changes in um, process conditions. It can be designed and built to specific needs for a little cost. So being in a mechanical device, we can very easily alter the size of the unit, the, the functionality of the unit, the specifications of the unit to meet customer specific customer requirements. Um, redundant sensing. So a lot of times there are there are applications out there or uh, code requirements for a um, tank to have multiple different types of t uh, sensing technologies on the tank. So a lot of times you'll have a level transmitter and then also a have to have a secondary level control device, which would be a um, one of our level switches. So ideal for SIL applications is key. Our our level switches have SIL a SIL rating on them that allows us to achieve that goal. Provides economical option for reliable safety shutoff switches as well. Um, reliability, these often operate well beyond their warranty period. Seen switches last well beyond 20 years in service and, and their warranty is five years, so that's a much longer uh, lifespan over the years, the rated years of their warranty. Install base, this has a very large install base, so MRO business is very high. Um, and then also, um, there's really, they're really not phasing this type of technology out. This technology is kind of tr proven and is still used today very often in, in plants. So one of the biggest applications is going to be power plant applications, whether it's a coal fire power plant, a natural gas power plant, or even a, a solar, concentrated solar power plant. Um, you're going to see these level switches inside of those power plants. It's just there's no way of getting around it. In, in, in these applications. So some of those applications in the power plant are going to be high pressure feed water heaters. So high pressure feed water heaters are one of the most 
high pressure, high temperature applications you can get. And with our level switches, we can actually achieve those with pretty much using our 108, 208 products um, that use high temperature, high pressure that can go up, upwards of 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit and then also high pressures as well. Uh, steam drip legs. Steam drip legs are all over power plants. Um, so to increase the efficiency and make sure that and increase the life of the power plant, they want to make sure that condensate does not actually get into the turbines and into um, the equipment that is using to generate the power. So a lot of times they'll have these condensate drip legs, these steam dr condensate drip legs, that will actually catch that condensate and then dump it out, depending on where the level at is at, and they want to control that level. And these are going to be very high temperature, high pressure applications as well. And you can see our capabilities over there. We have custom capabilities to really achieve those extreme high temperatures. Deaerators. So deaerators are very common for level switch applications. They're not as high of temperature, high of pressures. Um, so they can go to a much lower cost, 221, instead of a 108, 208. Redundant high level. So we've already talked about this, a displacer type level switch with a manual check option. So for petroleum tank, petroleum tank farms, um, these are used quite often just for high level measurement or high level alarm or shutdown. And then on these large tanks, we actually have the ability to install a manual check option. That manual check option allows you to check to see if that level switch is working from the bottom of the tank. API 2350, this is a, a requirement to have redundant technologies for measuring level in a tank of a certain size that is carrying a class one or class two product. So this is every type of application that has a tank farm like this will probably have one of our high, high alarm, critical high level alarm um, level switches. Flash tanks here, I'm running a little behind, so I'm going to try to speed this up a little bit, but flash tanks are another application for high temperature, high pressure. Uh, condenser level as well, high pressure, high temperature. Fuel oil storage, so power plants, they often have fuel oil storage for their ignition systems. Um, these, these large tanks will always have level switches on there for high level overflow protection as well. I went a little bit over time. Um, I'm, I'm meant to stop a little bit, uh, five minutes early, but um, that's all I have for the day. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, to, if anyone has any questions, I'll stick around here for the next five, ten minutes to answer any questions that you guys have over um, the, what was just said. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to type those into the chat box, and we'll make sure to get those answered. But um, a recording and this presentation will be sent out after this, um, so to make sure that you guys have that. So, um, yeah, thanks, everyone, for joining, and have a great day.